decided in the affirmative. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012 and for related purposes. So orders of the day number two, Fuel Security Bill 2021 and a related bill, second reading debate. Thank you. I'll just allow senators to exit the Senate before I give Senator Pratt the call. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This bill is indeed welcome, but it is this government's failures, unfortunately, that has made this legislation before the parliament tonight necessary. Our nation needs a secure fuel supply. We need to move around our country from A to B. We need it to fly around our regions, particularly in a big state like WA, which is my home state. We need to be able to get to our workplace here in Canberra. Our nation needs it to move its goods and people from A to B. Everything we use—groceries, construction supplies, medical equipment—it is a critical uh, good for our nation on which our access to everything else depends. We know from the last 18 months that we can't take our ability to get things from A to B for granted and, indeed, our fuel supply. It is now, only now is this government taking any action on fuel security. Our country is now close to 100 per cent dependent on international supply chains, and we're seeing job losses across refineries around our country as refineries have closed down. And indeed, this has been the case in my own home state of Western Australia. But we've seen these warning clouds on the horizon for a long time. They've been brewing for years. Under this government, we've seen many a broken promise on fuel security and on job security for Australia's fuel workers. A Senate inquiry back in 2015, that's right, six years ago, recommended the Australian government undertake a comprehensive review of Australia's fuel security problem. And then the government didn't even start this review or announce it until 2018 with a due date of late 2019. Fuel security and the job security of thousands of refinery workers, like everything else with this government, only gets a call up when there is a bad front page. The interim report on the liquid fuel security was delivered to the government some two years ago, more than two years ago, April 2019. This government has not even released this final report, which was due again in late 2019. It's a government that has delayed and neglected the basics, the basics that we need to keep this country running. The government chose not to act then, to not even deliver the final report so that we could see in this nation what was really going on. Thanks to that failure to act, our country has been left almost entirely reliant on global supply chains for one of our most critical domestic inputs. The interim report identified a number of things that could have been done a couple of years ago. It identified serious non-compliance with the international energy obligations for domestic fuel stocks, our requirement is to have 90 days of fuel to help protect against global uh, and domestic oil shocks. We weren't compliant then and we aren't compliant now. What will happen in our country if uh, what will happen in our country if one of the global uh, production places, say Singapore, 
if the stock all gets tied up there and we don't have access to those inputs. Not one year in the last eight have we been compliant for the right number of uh, stores. This leaves our nation wide open to fuel security shocks, and it also leaves our national security vulnerable. We're only at 58 days of supply now. That is still a massive 32 days short of that 90 days. This is really significant for Australian families, businesses and industry. Most Australian households spend the same amount of money on fuel as they do on electricity and gas combined. We must have secure supply to prevent against price shocks to Australia's families and businesses. It's critical for our national security. We need fuel stocks for industry, defence and aviation in our volatile world. And for a government that likes to talk really big on national security, on this key issue, so important to national security, they've been years missing in action. The interim report went as far to call, on, call Australia an outlier into the approach in, a, in their, our approach to fuel security. We are an outlier because our fuel stocks have been far from secure. Indeed, the government's appalling record on electric vehicles makes our appalling fuel security stocks and the predicament that leaves even worse. And it exposes Australian families even more. In amongst this government's inaction on fuel security is the government's ideological uh, bent against electric vehicles. Their policy neglect ne leaves us an outlier here too. It consigns Australian drivers to high fuel costs, takes away choice and maintains our dependence on foreign fuel rather than our own renewable energy sources. The Electric Vehicle Council notes the lack of policy action has rendered the Australian market uniquely hostile to electric vehicles. And sadly, he's not wrong. Australia used to be uh, a world leader, leader in many fields, including electric vehicles like vaccines and any other number of measures. But under this government, we're at the back of the pack with Australians missing out. Only 0.7 per cent of cars sold here in Australia are electric, compared to a global average of 4.2 per cent, 11 per cent in the UK and 75 per cent in Norway. This is not because Australians don't want them. A majority of Australians say they'd consider one for their next car. But there are simply no electric cars available in Australia for under, under $40,000 and just five for under $60,000. By comparison, there are eight models cheaper in the UK than the cheapest model in Australia. We've seen under this government inaction and scaremongering by the government, including the Prime Minister and multiple front benches saying electric vehicles will end the weekend. And we've seen entrenched higher costs for electric vehicles, higher transport costs for families and, Mr Deputy President, uh, much higher emissions. Labor's electric car discount will cut import tariffs and fringe benefits uh, tax off non-luxury electric vehicles in our country. The fact that this government still has no electric vehicle policy in 2021 is a significant embarrassment, an embarrassment that costs families at the Bowser, exacerbates our fuel security issues, which under this government have been left to languish. We've seen little delivery on fuel security and fuel jobs under this government. Those on the other side will want to point to the pandemic as the reason our fuel security is in dire straits and point to that as the reason that this package is needed. But that's a convenient distraction from their lack of stewardship for Australia's fuel sector over the last eight years. Here's the timeline. 
In 2015, a Senate inquiry, five years before COVID, recommended a comprehensive review into our fuel security problem. It took this government three years until 2018 to announce that they would even look at the issue. We finally get an interim report four years after it's been recommended by the Senate inquiry back in April 2019, and it was absolute crickets from then on. This was until, of course, we get an opportunity for a photo op last September, a photo opportunity that del delivered nothing in terms of fuel security <coughs> and nothing in terms of job security for fuel sector workers. We have a government that likes to pretend they are a friend of working people, of people in traditional energy industries, but their record on fuel refineries is about as good as their record on the now non-existent auto manufacturing industry in this country. A reminder that this government's announcement of the fuel security package as part of last year's budget and what it has delivered. So let's take a look at this now. They promised, according to the media release, a fuel security package that was going to secure Australia's long-term fuel supply. Supply. It was going to create a thousand new jobs. What have we seen since then? We've seen the closure announcements of two of Australia's only four remaining refineries. That's right. Half of Australia's refineries have announced closure since this announcement. In September, the Morrison and, Morrison and Taylor, Prime Minister Morrison and Mr Taylor claimed their package would back local refineries to stay open. Just six weeks later, in October, the Quinana refinery announced that it would close. On the 14th of December, Minister Taylor claimed the government was taking immediate and decisive action to keep our domestic, fineries op domestic refineries operating. But within two months, on the 10th of February this year, Exxon announced its Altona refinery would also close. What about those jobs, Mr Acting Deputy President? Those two refineries alone, they directly employ 950 people between them. Thousands more in fuel-dependent industries are on the line. Australia's petrochemical Manufacturers all rely on by-products produced from these refineries, those that have announced closures. This is dire for our plastics and other industries in Australia. It's more proof that the government knows how to talk about jobs but doesn't actually know how to deliver them for working Australians. Labor knew this photo opportunity last September was insufficient. We warned then that it was inadequate and would fail to address Australia's fuel security needs. Just as we have warned for years about our increasing dependence on foreign fuel imports in what is our clo changing global environment. We've gone from relying on imports for 60 per cent of our refined fuels in 2018 to having a 90 per cent dependence on imports of liquid fuels now. This package of bills does nothing to address Australia's lack of a strategic fleet. We're still completely reliant on a fleet of foreign-owned tankers. This at a time when we're talking about the drums of war beating, when those opposite are talking about that, and our fuel security is in a disastrous shape under your watch. Government inaction has hung workers out to dry. It has worsened our national fuel security and it's left Australian families, businesses and industry exposed to fuel shocks in an increasingly uncertain world. Mr Deputy President, government neglect over electric vehicles worsens this predicament. So while we welcome this package of bills today, it simply comes too late for the workers at Quinana and Altona. It comes after eight consistent years of not having enough onshore fuel stocks. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator the Rice. This bill is not about fuel security. It's about two billion dollars. It's about handing over two billion dollars to the government's oil company mates to try and prop up ageing, polluting oil refineries that are on their last legs. If this bill was really about fuel security, meaning ensuring sufficient fuel for transport so that we can keep transporting goods and people around the country in the short, medium and long term, you would th think that it would actually move us forward on focusing on the two things in its name, namely what in particular types of fuel should we be using to be um, moving people and goods around the country? What does it make sense? What type of fuels does it make sense to be supporting? And then secondly, securing the supplies of those fuels. And if there's two billion dollars on offer, then you'd think that any sensible government would want to ensure that that two billion dollars is spent wisely on these fuels and does in fact secure the supplies of these fuels. But no, this bill is fixated only on propping up the production of polluting fossil fuels, petrol, diesel and jet fuel, rather than pay any um, attention at all to clean alternatives. This legislation is extraordinarily out of step with the times, at a time when the rest of the world is taking action to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, when governments around the world are committing to ending subsidies on fossil fuels, to committing to slashing their carbon pollution. We are increasing our dependency. We are increasing our subsidies. It is just so wrong. This bill is basically providing massive handouts of our taxpayer dollars to some of the biggest polluters in the country. And this is when we're in a climate crisis, when the number one responsibility of any responsible government, any government concerned about security and safety of the community, has got to be shifting away from burning and using oil, coal and gas. I mean, just let's have a bit of a think about what could be done with $2 billion that not only would secure supplies of, cl of clean fuels and or people and goods to be transported using a minimum of fuel, even perhaps none at all. I mean, let me just summarise some of the options that this government is obstinately ignoring in their quest to prop up their fossil fuel mates. I mean, number one is serious support for electric vehicles. And that means electric cars, it means electric buses, it means electric freight vehicles. How about having an electric vehicle strategy? How about having some targets like other countries all around the world, conservative, other conservative governments all around the world have done? How about rolling out a network of fast charging infrastructure so that everybody in the country has got the opportunity to drive a non-polluting electric vehicle? How about some incentives to help overcome the fact that electric vehicles are, on average in Australia at the moment, $20,000 to $30,000 more expensive than internal combustion engine vehicles? How about requiring that people who are importing vehicles actually have to import a proportion of their vehicles being clean, clean vehicles? How about investing in renewable energy to power these electric vehicles, turning Australia into a renewable energy superpower? Solar, wind, pumped hydro, upgrading the grid to make sure that it's fit for purpose for renewables and so we can shift it around to where it's needed. How about investing in green hydrogen produced by this abundance of renewable energy? And then the hydrogen infrastructure so that it can be used for heavy vehicles, freights, freight, trains, and sub substituted for fossil fuel gas and exported as a zero carbon fuel to the world? How about investing in public transport and walking and cycling infrastructure to give people the opportunity to get out of their private vehicles altogether? Give people the choice of great public transport and they use it. Give people the option of riding their bikes safely, which requires no more fuel than your wheat bix in the morning, and give them the choice of doing that on dedicated bike infrastructure and people will use it. How about investing in low carbon or zero carbon shipping, investing in electric aircraft, producing biodiesel and other green liquid fuels like producing jet fuel from algae? 
In other words, taking the type of actions that governments all around the country are doing at the moment. They're taking this seriously, tackling two problems hand in hand, tackling our fuel security concerns and tackling the climate crisis. But no. I mean, just imagine that we had a target like Norway does of no sales of new internal combustion engines by 2025. That's in four years' time. Or in the UK, of a ban on the sales of new internal combustion cars by 2030. Now imagine, like in Norway and in the UK and in Germany and other countries around the world, that we actually were seeing a rapid shift to electric vehicles. Imagine what that would do for our need for polluting petrol and diesel. Correct. It would absolutely slash our need for polluting petrol and diesel. Our fuel security problem would be well on the way to being solved. When the government and the Labor Party talk jobs as being a reason why they are going to support this massive subsidy for refineries. The Prime Minister's media release speaks of this cash splash resulting in 3,000 jobs, 1,250 direct employees across the two refineries and creating up to another 1,750 construction jobs. I'm, I'm very curious actually about the projected up to 1,750 construction jobs that, be that are apparently going to be created to accelerate the necessary major infrastructure upgrades. I, mean, I think we need to take this figure with a very big grain of salt and note that these construction jobs are only likely to last for a few years. And as for securing the jobs of the 1,250 workers in the two refineries, well, apparently the government has secured a commitment that these refineries won't close before 2027. That's six years. And I would not be betting any money at all on them continuing beyond that, given the age of these refineries and given where the world and Australia needs to be in terms of slashing our use of petrol, diesel and jet fuel beyond that. But look, let's just take it at face value. Let's pretend that these job numbers are real and let's do the sums. $2 billion for 3,000 jobs is 666,667 dollars per job. $666,000 per job, each of which may only be for a few years. This is a really serious subsidy for fossil fuel jobs that could be spent so much better in helping the shift to jobs in clean, green, zero carbon industries. And why does this matter? Why do we care about where our money is spent, whether it's spent on propping up oil refineries or in clean energy? And it's because I'll bring it back to the basics, what every government in the world should be focusing on as its most urgent task. We are facing a climate crisis. We are facing a climate crisis where, on current projections, we are headed to global average temperatures three, four or more degrees above what is safe for humanity and the rest of life on the planet. And four degrees of global heating means no more growing wheat in Australia. It means pretty much no more growing anything in the areas that are currently our major agricultural production zones. It means metres of sea level rise, flooding the homes of millions of Australians. It means wildfires that are more extreme, hotter, more, uh, more extensive than they were in 2019-20, Black the Black Summer fires. And it means more extreme floods when there aren't fires. It means unaccountable numbers of plants and animals going extinct. It means billions of people across the world who are climate refugees, homeless, without a way to feed themselves and looking to find anywhere on the planet where they can survive. And it means billions more people suffering, struggling to survive, living absolutely wretched lives. This is why it matters. This is why we need to be taking urgent action, that there is no more time for half-heartedness. There is no more more time for half solutions. There is no more time for subsidising the polluting fossil fuel industries. I mean, other countries around the world they have accepted this, this challenge. I mean, let me remind you of what the G7 um, agreed to just over a week ago. They agreed to more than 
halve, to halve their collective emissions by 2030, to end fossil fuel subsidies by 2025, not to hand out billions of dollars to oil refineries, and to achieve an overwhelmingly decarbonised power system in the 2030s. I mean, Australia is part of the world, yes. We consider ourselves an advanced, developed country, yes. We are not separate on another planet. We have responsibilities to play our part. And the good news is, of course, that there are so many ways that we can be shifting to zero carbon, zero carbon technologies. There are so many ways that we can be changing the ways that we are living, working, producing food and fibre and manufacturing. I mean, some of these technologies are mature technologies. Some of them need some more work and development. And it really makes sense to get a move on with the more mature technologies while we sort out the rest. And these mature technologies, of course, include renewable energy, they include batteries, they include electric vehicles. Transport is an area where we can actually made, make huge inroads, and transport is 20 per cent of our carbon pollution. It makes so much sense to be doing everything we can to be shifting our transport to zero carbon transport. This is such an opportunity. If we've got a government that's got $2 billion that it wants to spend to be, to be creating fuel security, well then I can tell you there are so many ways that it could be spending that that not only is going to be creating fuel security, but it's also going to be making big strides for us tackling our carbon pollution. I mean, which brings me back to this bill before us today. I mean, basically, while the rest of the world is acting, it is transforming their, their fleets of vehicles, this government has its head buried in the sand. And despite waiting more than two years for any kind of action on electric vehicles, this government is just ignoring them, and it's bringing forward legislation like this. And it's still scrambling even on this bill. It's rushing urgently to get it through the Senate without a proper process. It did not get referred off to committee. There was no public exposure draft to the bill for community consultation. There's been no Senate inquiry process. I mean, the, it, it was opposed by the government when we suggested it. Instead, we have got a rushed artificial deadline of the 1st of July to hand over an enormous amount of money without any scrutiny. I'm going to be moving a series of amendments to this bill to try and improve this awful piece of legislation. And we think that they are very sensible, reasonable amendments. And I really hope that the government and the Labor Party will be supporting them to improve this awful bill. I mean, first up, Instead of spending $2 billion on fuel refineries, we should be spending that sort of money on a national electric vehicle strategy with public investment in charging infrastructure, with incentives to encourage people to shift from polluting vehicles into electric vehicles. We've also got an amendment that's going to require the, Pro the Productivity Commission to report on this framework and how cost-effective it is compared to other mechanisms. I mean, the government, the Liberal Party, like to say that they're cost efficient. The reality is that they use that argument whenever they want to oppose funding, sp spending, but never when it comes to subsidies for their mates. We also have an amendment that's going to require the government to provide more detail on the amount of subsidy spending and who it's gone to. Simple, basic transparency. And finally, we think that even if this goes ahead with paying money over to their fossil fuel mates, that this fuel security framework absolutely should not kick into action until the Liberal Party has actually taken some basic steps on electric vehicles. They're very reasonable, sensible steps. Just asking them publicly, what is your strategy on electric vehicles? And table analysis by the Productivity Commission as to how it compares to other countries. These are really sensible, basic transparency and accountability mechanisms that would at least mean that we would know what we were getting for our money. It would at least mean that you'd be able to compare the wisdom of subsidising the production of polluting fossil fuels compared with investing in clean technology. So let's be clear. 
The Greens support fuel security. We want real action to reduce our reliance on imported fossil fuels. We want clear policy with public consultation on how we can improve fuel security. But this bill does nothing of the store. It's handing over $2 billion to fuel refineries. And, I mean, the regulation impact statement didn't even consider the option of encouraging EV. This bill is an embarrassment for the Liberal Party, and we hope that the Senate will be supporting Order. our very sensible amendments. Some time has expired. Senator Rice, did you have a second reading amendment? If so, would you like to move that now? I did, yes. So I would like to move my second reading amendment, which I haven't got the details in front of me. But um, I will give the call to you then after. In my the next, name, uh, my second reading reader. amendment that's, in, that's been circulated in my name. Okay, thank you. We'll take that as moved. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fuel Security Bill 2021. Uh, the Australian fuel market operates on a near just in time basis and is heavily reliant on global supply chains operating under normal conditions. This helps to keep operational costs low, but means the market is ve very vulnerable to disruptions. <clears throat> in the Northern Territory, this near just in time was replaced with a ran out of time event when we actually ran out of bulk fuel. This happened just as I was leaving to come down here for these two weeks sittings. <clears throat> just before I left the Northern Territory, we actually ran out of bulk fuel supplies. Uh, while domestic users were largely unaffected, motorists did notice a price spike and industry was forced to jump in and do what industry does, particularly in the Northern Territory, and find a solution. And they found this solution by sending multiple road trains interstate to pick up fuel and bring it back to the Northern Territory to supply the Bowsers. The federal government was not advised by the Gunnar Labor government, as it should do, on this dire fuel supply situation in the Northern Territory. Now, the Greens over here don't care about fuel. They don't believe in fossil fuels and they'd like us to stop using it. Well, perhaps you'd like to come to the Northern Territory and tell the people there that they should run their tractors or road trains on solar panels. And I certainly haven't seen a, a plane or a helicopter running on pumped hydro. Imagine running an electric helicopter mustering cattle. You, I imagine you would probably move one beast 20 metres before you'd have to stop and recharge for 10 hours. They also want us to ride bicycles. Well, that's lovely if you live in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. I imagine you can ride a bicycle to the shop. But try telling the people of the Northern Territory that they should complete a 600-kilometre round trip on a bicycle just to go shopping. Absolutely a long ride, and you're not going to carry very much home, so you're going to be cycling to the shop 600 kilometres every day. Um, so it's, it's obvious to us that maintaining adequate fuel supplies is extremely important. And it's also a responsibility of state and territory governments to not let those supplies run out. Uh, and in this case, with the Gunnar Labor government, this was a complete abrogation of their responsibilities not to, at the very least, inform us of the dire situation the Northern Territory is facing. Um, now, this issue came about because of a convergence of problems, as, um, and th as things often do, um, none of which had been adequately appreciated or understood by Chief Minister Michael Gunner or his government. The problem was that international shipping had been affected due to COVID-19. This combined with the extra demand from domestic users and people travelling to the Northern Territory uh, as part of their, their annual holidays because they can't go overseas, so Darwin became their new barley, which was great, but this extra demand placed uh, a lot of pressure on our fuel supplies. Also combined with the fact that there is only one bulk storage facility in the Northern Territory, VOPAC at East Arm Port, which meant we sailed extremely close to the red line of empty. Uh, in fact, industry went into the red and domestic service stations 
had the supplies that were in their tanks at the time alone. Uh, a ship did sail into Darwin Port approximately five days after the bulk supplies ran out. But the problem is when one a ship turns up, it takes another three to five days to have the fuel tested uh, and then unloaded, distributed and settled in tanks before it becomes available to um, retailers and domestic supplies. Um, I've been working with the Energy and Emissions Reduction Minister, Angus Taylor, to ensure that the Territory does not face these types of issues again due to the uh, fragile nature of our fuel supplies and the behaviour of the Gunnar Labor government. The federal government's 10-year comprehensive fuel security package includes a storage program called Boosting Australia's Diesel Storage, imaginatively named, which will see domestic fuel supplies increase by 40 per cent by 2024. Hopefully, as we, we move into the future with these programs in place, we in the Northern Territory will not face such a, a fragile environment again. Um, the, net, the fuel security package aims to increase Australia's resilience to fuel supply disruptions, secure sovereign refining capability and keep fuel prices low for consumers. Uh, Mr Ac Acting Deputy President, I um, commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, thank you. I, um I can indicate, of course, as uh, the previous Labor speaker did, that Labor will support this legislation. I've listened with interest to the uh, contributions thus far. I mean, if you take this issue of fuel security, it really revolves around three central concerns that I think even the Prime Minister accepts are actually national responsibilities. It's a bloke who's ducked most of responsibilities for the core issues for Australians over the course of the pandemic, but I think even he accepts that energy policy, industrial capability and national security are core national responsibilities. Um, after, after listening to the last two contributions, you, know, you can see why the Liberal Party uh, and the Greens can never be trusted on these core national issues. Uh, the bill does involve a substantial, a substantial subsidy uh, to the two remaining uh, oil refineries. The key question that Australians should be asking, though, is what took you so long? What took you so long? These are sensible measures that should have been implemented when there were four oil refineries, four operating oil refineries, instead of now just two. For all of the lapse of honour that the government is demanding for taking these measures, it's actually the Australian Labor movement that has been campaigning around fighting to make fuel security a national interest priority. In particular, I want to acknowledge the Australian Workers' Union, who have fiercely advocated for their members in the refining sector for years. Similarly, my old union, the AMW, has long represented maintenance workers in this sector. As an official, I saw very closely what impact the refinery closures in Sydney had, not just on the workers. And anybody can do the sort of cheap maths and add up the number of workers and divide it by the package. There are, of course, the interests of the workers who are directly employed. There are the interests of the subcontractors who work in those facilities, many, many thousands of them. There are the interests of the hundreds of firms, Australian firms, in the supply chains that rely upon these refineries. And then, of course, there is the interest of our future manufacturing capability and our future national security interest, all of which have been entirely ignored by this government until the pressure got too much. Both the transport workers and the maritime union have also been publicly campaigning to raise awareness on these issues. There are still outstanding concerns. Australia will still be non-compliant with its International Energy Agency obligation 
to hold 90 days of reserves. Australia will still depend disproportionately on imported fuel from vulnerable supply chains, still leaving us vulnerable to geopolitical tensions. We still lack a strategic national fleet, which leaves us reliant on a fleet of internationally owned, operated and crewed tankers. There is no Australian fleet. In the event of a crisis, the government would not be able to requisition tankers because we don't have any. The bill has become too late for the hundreds of refinery workers who have lost their jobs, the thousands of direct subcontractors and supply chain firms. Uh, they join thousands of workers, of course, from Holden and Ford in the shipbuilding industries and rail manufacturing who have lost their jobs as a result of this government's negligence when it comes to manufacturing capability and fuel security. Tens of thousands of blue-collar jobs, of technical jobs, the people who actually wear high vis to work actually have it as a requirement of their job, not a dress up for a photo opportunity, but actually put it on seven days a week, get up early in the morning and go to work. This uh, crisis has all of the familiar tropes of the Morrison government, an obvious problem left unsolved, ministers posted far above their obvious competence, rank amateurism that costs Australians their jobs, press conferences with the little flag lapels and all of the hot waffle that comes, up, comes along in a Morrison press conference, saying the word sovereign over and over again uh, while trying Senator, to look tough. Senator Ayres, you do need to refer to the Prime Minister by his correct title, and you, personal reflections are disorderly. You are absolutely right. Uh, the Prime Minister wraps himself in the flag and overuses these words over and over again, but never ever delivers in the national interest. He talks about it, but he never ever delivers. All about the announcement, never about the follow through. Political fixes to systemic problems. Uh, absolute failure of leadership from the top down. Policy after policy dragged kicking and screaming uh, to the most basic of solutions. And then they celebrate like they've won the World Cup. The government has been warned for years that fuel security was a matter of national importance. The question is, why did it take them so long to act? In 2013, Air Vice Marshal John Blackburn, retired Deputy Chief of the RAF, warned that Australia has, he said, small and declining fuel stocks, about three weeks' worth of oil and refined fuels. His report described long maritime supply chains for liquid fuels, supply chains that run through a number of conflict zones, vulnerabilities to trading systems, shipping ports and refineries. He concluded, if a scenario such as a confrontation in the Asia-Pacific region were to happen, our fuel supplies would be severely constrained and we do not have a viable contingency plan in place to provide adequate supplies for Australia's essential everyday services and for our military forces. And what did the government do? Nothing. It wasn't the last time this issue and Air Vice Marshal Blackburn were going to be ignored. In June 2015, the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport tabled its report into Australia's transport energy resilience and sustainability. Their first recommendation, that the Australian government undertake a comprehensive whole-of-government risk assessment of Australia's fuel supply, availability and vulnerability. The assessment should consider the vulnerabilities in Australia's fuel supply to possible disruptions resulting from military actions, acts of terrorism, natural disasters, industrial accidents and financial and other st structural dislocation. What happened? Nothing. In March 2018, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on, uh, the Commi the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security recommended and they said that the Department of Home Affairs, in consultation with the Department of Defence and the Department of the Environment and Energy, review and develop measures to ensure that Australia has a continuous supply of fuel to meet its national security priorities. And what happened? Nothing. Diddly squat. 
Later that year, Senator Mullen began publicly criticising his own government's failure to hold fuel reserves in Australia. He told Alan Jones correctly, correctly, the vulnerabilities are very, very high. It is a critical national security issue. He's been publicly criticising them ever since, and he hasn't been the only one. You can't find somebody in the defence and national security uh, institutions that doesn't think this is a critical issue that has been ignored for year after year. In 2018, the International Energy Agency published an in-depth report into the Australian energy policies. It found as follows. Australia is the only IEA country which is a net oil importer and solely relies on the commercial stockholding of industry to meet its minimum 90-day stockholding obligation under the International Energy Program. The country does not have public stockholdings and does not place a minimum stockholding obligation on its domestic oil industry. And what happened in relation to that finding? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. April 2019, the Department of Environment and Energy indicated that Australia had a reserve of 18 days of petrol, 22 days of diesel and 23 days of jet fuel. What happened to this, when this obviously urgent state of affairs was revealed to the government by its own department? Nothing. Nothing. No policy change, no administrative action, no substance, nothing. The only thing that could get anyone in this eight-year-old, tired, ineffective government even mildly interested in fuel security was the, was the possibility of controversial oil and gas projects. In 2019, then Resources Minister Senator Canavan cynically tried to use fuel security to open up oil exploration in the Great Australian Bight. Air Marshal, Air Marshal Blackburn, who had now been lobbying for this issue to be taken seriously for five years, said of this obvious political grandstanding, guaranteed flow of oil is what's important, and its stockholding is the spring in the supply chain when it goes on and off. The government has done little or nothing to guarantee this. Year after year, the government has been warned that we are facing a problem as a nation. And year after year, this government, the Morrison, Turnbull, Abbott, Truss, Joyce, um, the, the other guy was his name, McCormack, Joyce government, has done nothing. It took an utter crisis for the government to act, and in the intervening period, half of our oil refining capability in Australia has gone, disappeared for good. And these guys want to do a victory lap. Of course, the government hasn't had a real energy policy for eight years. Well, this crisis came along, and they've had to jerry rig something together. The government announced a comprehensive fuel security package in September last year. Nothing guarantees that something's not comprehensive like when the government announces that it is. The government said it was committed to a sovereign onshore refinery capacity despite the threat to the viability of the industry. Minister Taylor said, our fuel security package will keep fuel prices for Australian consumers amongst the lowest in the OECD. It will create around 1,000 new jobs and protect the existing jobs of our farmers, truckers, miners and tradies. You know how long it lasted? Three days. It lasted just three days. Three days later, BP announced the closure of Australia's largest refinery in Quinana. Three days. And so in December, there was another announcement. Minister Taylor announced that the government was taking immediate and decisive action to keep our domestic refineries operating. I mean, why does anybody pay any attention to what Minister Taylor or Prime Minister Morrison say? It's all about the spin. It's all about the announcement. Two months later, after this breathless announcement from Minister Taylor, two months later, ExxonMobil announced that they were closing their refinery in Altona. 350 jobs lost. So one announcement lasted for three days. The other one lasted for 60 days. Within six months 
of the government's comprehensive fuel security package, so-called, half of Australia's refineries had announced their closure. And so now we've got another package. More press conferences with monogrammed high vis being worn by ministers hoping to line up with the Prime Minister for another, another photo shoot. It's the old Nick on and then Nick off from the Morrison government. And the government wants to be congratulated for finally dragging itself over eight long years to a basic modicum of a fuel security package that will achieve about half of what is required. So Labor will support this piece of legislation. But we will point out that this government ignores the advice, a hostile to the experts, that their incapacity to develop an energy policy framework does real harm, not just to household bills by driving the price of energy up, not just to manufacturing jobs by reducing investment certainty, not, by, not just by making it harder for businesses to invest in the kind of industry that creates good jobs, but it does real damage to our national security. It's a government that's entirely lost its way, lost its way a long time ago. Uh, and the Australian public should send this government packing the next opportunity that they have and get a real government that will actually deliver a national fuel security framework, a manufacturing framework that actually might create a few decent jobs, that might actually lift our national capability instead of pushing it backwards. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I stand to speak on this, uh, uh, on this fuel security bill. Uh, and look, I indicate up front that I'll be supporting the bill, but I, like uh, Senator Ayres, concern, uh, yeah, share, share concerns about the, the way in which we got to this place, the way in which we got to this point. I'll go back to, uh, uh, back to two, 2000, when we imported 60 per cent of our liquid fuels. By 2013, the demand had grown and, over, uh, and, and basically we'd seen our production uh, drop, substantially reduce, and we now import more than, or back in 2013, had moved to 90 per cent uh, importation of our liquid fuels. Now, moving on slightly forward, so that, that, uh, that's uh, the state that we're in. We had, uh, back in 2012, we had seven refineries. By 2015, that had dropped down to four. Now, this is about the same time that the Senate started looking at things uh, uh, in relation to fuel security, and I refer back to the, uh, the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee into Australia's transport energy resilience and sustainability. So the alarm bells were ringing back then. We could see what was happening. We were importing most of our fuel, and we, we saw our refineries uh, decreasing uh, uh, you know, substantially to only having four. And it's at that time we started looking at the numbers of days of fuel that we had uh, available in stock actually here in this country. Now, the government will try and claim that they're meeting some of their international obligations, the 90-day obligations, by saying, <clears throat> we've got fuel on the way. We've got fuel in ships on the way. But actually, that's not allowed to be counted. And sensibly, not allowed to be counted because it's not, it's not on hand. It's not fuel that you have available. Many things could happen that could disrupt that fuel actually making it to Australia. So uh, we, we probably should not count that. So you know, that was the situation. We've actually seen some other reviews. We've had joint uh, parliamentary and House uh, committee reviews into fuel security. And we were supposed to have uh, uh, one of the recommendations uh, that came from those committees was that there ought to be a liquid fuel security review, which has occurred and sat on the, the minister's desk for two years. For two years, it sat there. Now, um, I, I looked uh, at my notes over the last week or so, and I, and I did actually FOI that document with the claim 
that it's, uh, that it's a cabinet document. I'm now seriously starting to, to doubt that claim uh, that, that, a, that a, you know, a document sitting on the minister's desk for two years destined for cabinet. What sort of responsiveness are we getting in respect of government in relation to uh, all of this? I'll go back to uh, perhaps another sign where, where, where we had some difficulties back in 2018. Great international event, military event, pitch black exercise 2018, ran over three weeks from July through August 2018. We had, uh, we had uh, 16 uh, different air forces there. 16 different air forces. We had 140 aircraft. Our military uh, conducting exercises, preparing for Defence of Australia type activities, working with other air forces, working with our allies. And what happens? We run out of fuel. We run out of fuel because a ship that was supposed to be coming from Singapore didn't turn up. So we had to end the exercise early. Now, if that wasn't a signal that there was a problem, then I don't know uh, what sort of signal you can, you can expect. Maybe a pandemic helps you realise that supply lines can be interrupted. Supply lines can be interrupted uh, even by, the, by way of border closures. You we're just hearing of, uh, of refi the refinery shutting down in Quinana, Western Australia's supply. And you'll also recall throughout the uh, pandemic that uh, Minister Taylor announced that he had uh, bought into uh, uh, reserves in the United States. Bought into reserves in the United States. And I asked some questions about, uh, about this uh, strategic oil that we'd purchased. And uh, in answers that I got from Minister Taylor, he, he revealed the, the arrangements. He said the arrangements between the, the Australian and the United States government were not legally binding, not treaty level agreements, instead a lesser government to government uh, arrangement. Both governments had agreed the text of the arrangements, but that remains secret. We've, we've not seen what that, uh, what that agreement is. The Australian government won't be tabling the text of the arrangement in the parliament. That was what uh, I was advised. And there will be no review by the joint standing committees on treaties. So we went off and purchased $94 million worth of fuel to stick in, in tanks in Louisiana, 14,000 kilometres away. 14,000 kilometres away sits our strategic reserves. Seriously? Is this a government that doesn't appreciate what happens in time of conflict? And we've already heard Senator Ayres telling us that we don't have ships that are, of a, that, that are flagged with an Australian, that have an Australian flag on them. So we can't really control what happens as we might do in wartime or in a time of conflict to get that fuel that is in Louisiana back to Australia. Sure, we got it cheap. I, we all remember the, the negative price of fuel, I think, that, that occurred uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the pandemic. But it actually doesn't help us in terms of uh, having fuel here in this country. So, you know, I do support the, the aim behind this bill. This bill does a couple of things. One of the things it does is have a uh, minimum storage obligation on refineries and, and, and on importers and storage uh, companies, and that's a good thing. And indeed, the government has announced $200 million to assist uh, 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 companies uh, uh, build up their storage uh, capability, and that's a good thing. So I'm not, uh, I'm not standing here saying we shouldn't do what we're doing. I'm just saying, standing here saying we're not doing enough. We've got something like, uh, you know, at best, let's say, to, get, to, give, to, be, to be generous to the government, about 30 days of fuel. Now, of course, if something happens, we do have a, a Liquid Fuel uh, Emergency Act that allows the minister to uh, intervene in the market and preserve our fuel for essential services. 
But anyone who knows any, anything about this topic will know that those powers are brought on very slowly. We would probably run out of fuel through its normal course of use before all of those powers kicked in. We have a real problem. We have a national resilience problem. I'd like to think that if, uh, if supplies were cut, we would have 90 days of fuel like we are required to have, so that we can keep our economy running, so that we can move across to various different measures to make sure that our economy runs to the extent that it's possible, but certainly to make sure that essential services are available and that our defence force doesn't run out of fuel. These are important issues, and these are the sorts of issues that one would expect the Liberal Party to be good at. They're normally very strong on defence, but they've ignored this. And Senator Mullen has stood up and said stuff about this bravely in the face of his own party's failure to do anything. This is a really important issue. So, you know, the other part of the bill is to, of course, assist with refineries to make sure that. Uh, that, uh, the, that uh, the two remaining refineries, remember there were four uh, uh, when the announcement was made, but two of them have said, no, nope, sorry, not interested. We have to rely on the, the ASX uh, companies, the two ASX refineries, uh, who have said they're going to stay, but we have to ov obviously assist them. We have to assist them to make sure that they stay on Australian soil. And I support that. I support us assisting those refineries. But there's an amendment that I'm going to move to this bill, and the amendment says that the government needs to provide a plan which it has to table in 2023, okay, so in a couple of years' time, that says what happens after 2027, what happens after 2030, which is the, the maximum extent to which the refineries can rely on, on, the, on the, the assistance. I want to know that, and, and I actually don't. I'm not trying to be prescriptive and say you've got to tell us um, what Rex wants to hear, what Senator Patrick wants to hear. I'm not asking for that. I just want to know what the government's plan is. Does it intend to continue supporting the refineries? If the uh, refineries are going to leave, how are you going to manage stock? Because they have some elasticity about them, in that there's an infeed to the to the refinery. Uh, and if, as long as that's full, we've got fuel usage that's, that's, coming out, uh, uh, that's coming out the other side available for Australians to use. I want to know how you intend to transition away from, uh, from fuels that are, that are potentially uh, not stocked here in Australia. So if we're not prepared to, to have 90 days of, of fuel, then we need to make sure that our country is running on things like electric, on hydrogen, on ammonia. We need to think about shifting some of our transport from, from, uh, road, uh, from, from road to rail or from rail to coastal shipping. We need to have a plan. It's a novel concept. Have a plan about energy security for this country. Now, I know I've got some support amongst the crossbench, and I'm hoping I'll get Labor's support for this, but I'd hope the government itself would say, you know what, having a plan is not a bad idea. Having a plan that we can put out in the public domain that's con that, uh, where people can contest it and, and maybe uh, enhance it, improvement, improve it in some way, would be a good thing. But I'm told the government's not going to support it. The government does not want to have a plan which is just consistent with everything that's happened to date. We've just stumbled along, stumbled along, stumbled along. We didn't wake up when we couldn't uh, properly fuel an, uh, an Air Force exercise, embarrassingly, and we haven't really learnt from the pandemic. The, the measures in this, in this bill are, are important. They're a step. But they are no, in any, in any way, 
could they be considered a comprehensive plan to deal with our fuel security? And it is an important issue. It's a really important issue. You know, I've looked at um, the United States strategy papers on, on how they might tackle a war with China. You know what they do? What, what their strategy is? They're going to cut off fuel through the through the Malacca Straits and across the Stan countries, the pipelines, and they'll probably take out the uh, the fuel supplies of China using uh, cruise missiles, possibly launched from submarines. But the point is, the U.S. strategy is to starve China of fuel. That's what they intend to do. And the Chinese are very alert to this. They know that that's, that's a, a weakness. They refer to the Malacca Straits as their Achilles heel. It's a huge problem for, for them. They're thinking about it. The United States is thinking about it. Yet we look at our own fuel security and we're not prepared to, to, to have a robust discussion, a robust debate. We're not prepared to, to, to act when the signals have been there, whether it's the 2014 Senate inquiry, whether it's the House inquiries, whether it's the NRMA-funded study that looked at fuel security. All of these things, the pitch black exercise, the pandemic, we are skating on thin ice and not reacting properly. And again, I'm moving an amendment during the committee stage that requires the government to lay out a plan. And how sensible is that? How sensible is that? The idea that we'll have a plan about energy security and we'd, we'd put that out of the public domain so industry can see it, so the public can see it, and we can all talk about it. But I fear the government is not going to support that. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. In the few minutes remaining before the adjournment, I want to rise briefly and um, commend the government on this very important bill, so important for our fuel security, for our energy security and for national security. And as a very proud Geelong-based Senator for Victoria, I was delighted to join Energy Minister Angus Taylor a few weeks ago to tour Viva Energy's Geelong refinery to celebrate this wonderful package, which has delivered such a massive win for Geelong workers. Uh, the Geelong refinery is home to some 700 local jobs. It's playing now a pivotal role in Australia's fuel security. It produces half of Victoria's fuel. And this package is so vital for the Geelong refinery, for manufacturing workers and to those opposite, particularly to Labor senators. The AMWU and the AWU have worked you out. Uh, they were rolling their eyes. There's never been any such proposal from Labor when it was in government. Only the Morrison government is delivering, delivering this security, a variable fuel security service payment uh, funded by the government which recognises the fuel security benefits that our two refineries provide to all Australians, up to $302 million to support the major refinery infrastructure to deliver better production and better quality fuels, bringing that forward by three years, and a $50.7 million dollars for the implementation and monitoring of the payment, uh, which uh, includes a minimum stockholding obligation. So this is the most incredibly important bill for our nation. And we heard nothing from Labor last year when the lockdown month after month in Victoria brought Viva Energy and the Geelong refinery to its knees. We saw none of the so-called um, empathy for manufacturing workers when Mr Miles declared that the end of thermal coal would be a good thing. Uh, we've seen policy after policy from Labor which demonstrates it does not care about energy security. The carbon tax, the 50 per cent RESH, the 45 per cent emissions reduction target, uh, all of these policies uh, union members across this country have worked out that Labor has deserted them. Uh, even the Andrews Labor government, when it was asked to make a contribution to Geelong Refinery, turned its back on one of Geelong's most important manufacturers. So 
uh, this is a very important piece of legislation. Order it will make a huge difference, and I commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you. Minister, I understand you wish to table some documents. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table a response to questions I took on notice today during question time and last week, which provides detail on the Pfizer vaccine as part of the COVID-19 rollout. Thank you. So I propose that the Senate now adjourn. And with the concurrence of the Senate, I'll ask the clerk to set the clock in accordance with the list circulated in the Senate. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, last week in the Senate, I spoke about a dam that Labor and Queensland are tearing down, Paradise Dam. Tonight, I want to talk about a dam that Labor and Queensland are refusing to build, Urana Dam. Urana Dam has been on the cards since 1957. And it's now finally going to happen because the private proponent is determined to deliver water security. We need this dam because of the huge demand for water in the region. It will transform Collinsville and Bowen the way Fairburn transformed Emerald. But, and it is a big but, bureaucracy and red tape, courtesy of Labor and Queensland, are delaying this project, stopping the creation of thousands of jobs and stopping the region from water security water security that it so desperately needs. To date, the proponent of Urana Dam has written and submitted over 4,000 pages to the state government. This process started in 2015 under Bowen River Utilities, and it has been a hard slog for them, but it is progressing. The environmental impact assessment is underway. There is an application for funding under the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. But Labor and Queensland are too inept to forward on an email to receive this money from the federal government, but I, but I am hopeful, very, very hopeful. It has been more than 200 days since Labor and Queensland committed to supporting the Urana Dam project, but a red tape and go-slow approach is stalling economic growth and jobs for North Queensland. It is sitting on a pile of bureaucratic paperwork, probably with Premier Palaget plonked on top. The Federal Liberal National Government has an open checkbook with $2 billion in funding as part of the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. But Labor in Queensland sadly just doesn't seem to care enough about water security in the regions to forward on just an email. Without water security, we won't have agriculture, fisheries, mining, manufacturing, horticulture, or the diversity of the North Queensland, indeed the Queensland economy. Urana Dam will create thousands of direct and indirect jobs during construction and then ongoing operations. But despite calling for federal government support for key water infrastructure projects like Urana Dam, lazy Labor in Queensland can't even submit the proper paperwork. If Labor were serious about water security and nation building infrastructure to fix our economy, create jobs, and deliver economic growth for North Queensland, they would support and forward on applications for federal government funding. This could be and will be the largest dam built since the Burdekin Falls Dam. With a capacity of 970,000 megalitres, Urana Dam would fill almost 40,000 Olympic swimming pools. It is the only water infrastructure project in North Queensland, North, North Australia even, to attract private investment. And maybe that's why Labor and Queensland are slowing it down. They know their own projects aren't as good. Enter Paradise Dam. And they don't like it when things happen, let alone when they happen by the private sector. By the private sector. Please, Labor in Queensland, fix Paradise Dam and build Urana. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to a trailblazer of Australian media. The Koori Mail is celebrating 30 years of publishing of sharing the voices of First Nations people on a national stage. The national newspaper is fully First Nations owned, telling our stories, celebrating our achievements and presenting the news through a black lens. Since its first edition 30 years ago, on the 23rd of May 1991, the Koori Mail has been at the cutting edge of First Nations affairs. Whether it was covering the tragedies of First Nations deaths in custody or the genesis of the Uluru Statement, or a local community barbecue, or a fashion show, you can find it in the pages of the Koori Mail. It was in the wake of the Deaths in Custody Royal Commission that Walbunya man Owen Carriage is credited with creating the Koori Mail. Along with Bunjalung pastor Frank Roberts, 
They were disappointed in the mainstream media coverage of the Royal Commission in particular and First Nations issues in general. The Koori Mail was born and the following year the paper was taken into the hands of the Bundjalung Nation. Thirty years later, it is still published out of Lismore in New South Wales, but as con contributors right around the country. It has trained a couple of generations of first-rate First Nations journalists and storytellers and continues to support and encourage young people looking at a career in media. It continues on the cutting edge of journalism and storytelling, branching out into the social media sphere and podcasting. It's not many newspapers in this current climate, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Pre President, that can celebrate more than 700 editions and still going strong. In the words of Koori Mail Chairperson Trevor Capine, it's our paper for our people. I visit First Nations communities around the country and wherever I go in cities, towns, remote communities, you can find a copy of the Koori, Koori Mail and people reading through the papers. It's, a, it's an example of why First Nations media is so critical to our national landscape. First Nations media connects communities, reflects aspirations and shares our culture. Local relevance and local language is at the centre of what they do. Industry members are the experts in getting information to communities in a way that is culturally appropriate, accessible and timely. As an example, the First Nations media sector worked enormously hard to ensure communities were kept informed of the latest health and safety advice during this pandemic. Brilliant local content was developed to get the message across, for example, community leaders and members taking part in videos about closures and also about promoting good hygiene. First Nations media is critical in emergency situations, broadcasting in local languages to local regions. First Nations journalists and commentators have shared their perspectives and knowledge with mainstream media programs. But it can't end here, and it's not good enough to just seek out the First Nations perspective during reconciliation or NAIDOC week, or at times of just simply controversy or drama. Including a First Nations lens in our discussion on all issues, local, regional and national, is critical if we are to play a role in shaping our own lives and futures in having a voice. And organisations like the Koori Mail are absolutely vital to this. Mr Acting Deputy President, I just want to congratulate the General Manager, Naomi Moran, who has recently taken over as Chair of First Nations Media Australia from Dot West, the editor, Rudy Maxwell, and all of the current and past staff who have worked so tirelessly and played a vital role in keeping First Nations stories and issues at the forefront, not only for First Nations people, but for all Australians. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Every year on the Queen's birthday, we honour special individuals that go above and beyond in servicing the community. Now, there were many worthy Australians that graced the list this year, and I would like to recognise individuals in areas close to my heart across Victoria. And I'll start in the beautiful North East, a place I visited only a few weeks ago. Loretta Carroll AM for significant service to the livestock industry and to the community. Dr Alan Curtis AM for significant service to environmental management, education and research. Vivian Ritchie AM for significant service to the Anglican Church of Australia and the community. Ken Broomhead OAM for service to the aviation industry. Margaret Docking OAM for service to the international community through health programs. Marion Ubergang, OAM, for dedication to tennis. Clive Walker, OAM, for service to the community of Myrtleford. Senior Sergeant Mark Hess and Superintendent Paul O'Halloran, who were both awarded the Australia Police Medal. And Gary Cook, who was awarded an Australian Fire Service Medal. I'd also like to mention some ins inspirational people in our northern and northwestern suburbs that have had an incredible impact. Dr Ian Frecklicken, QCAO, for distinguished service to the law across fields including health, medicine and technology. Dr Jane Melville, AM, for significant service to herpetology, uh, research and the museum sector. Uh, Dr oh, sorry, Susan Dorothy, AM, for significant service to the not-for-profit sector, fundraising and the law. 
Maria Alexiadis, OAM, for dedication and service to karate. Abigail Forsyth, OAM, for dedication to sustainable design. Liberty Sanger, OAM, for service to the law and to the community. Paul Hammett, OAM, for service to the community through pastoral care. Helen Pastacatharadoro, OAM, for service to the community of Hume. Casey Nunn, OAM, for service to the community of Craigieburn. Dr. Selva Nayagam Selvendra, OAM, for service to multicultural organisations and to medicine. And finally, I'd like to recognise those who have had a significant impact over the, the course of my political journey. Colin Tate, AM, a thought leader in superannuation and financial advice industries that has been recognised for significant service to the community through charitable initiatives. Amanda Miller, OAM, a digital innovation pioneer herself who has been recognised for service to the community through philanthropic and impact investment sectors. Kerry Chikorovsky, AM, a trailblazer for women in the Liberal Party who has been recognised for significant service to the Parliament of New South Wales and to the community. John Daly, AM, one of the sharpest minds and even the most rarefied of rooms, who has been recognised for significant service to public policy, uh, public policy development and to the community. Vivian Nguyen, AM, uh, for significant service to the multicultural communities of Victoria and particularly the Vietnamese community. Helen Shardy, OAM, a former state member of parliament, a member for Caulfield, and a member of my own uh, Liberal Women's Council, who has done terrific work serving on the boards of the Alfred Health and also Temple Beth Israel. She was recognised for service to the Jewish community of Victoria. James O'Halloran for outstanding public service to superannuation reforms and implementation of infrastructure to enable the government's economic support measures to Australians during COVID-19. The inimitable Peter Credlin AO for distinguished service to parliament and to politics, policy development and to the executive function of government. And of course, as a proud senator for Victoria and on MND Global Day, I couldn't possibly end this contribution without acknowledging Neil Danaher AM for his distinguished service to people with motor neurone disease and their families through advocacy, through public education and through fundraising initiatives. Uh, Mr uh, Acting, De Deputy, Acting Deputy President, I would like to send my congratulations to not only to those that I have mentioned but to all recipients of Queen's Birthday Honours. Australia is indeed a nation rich in diversity and these honours reflect that. I would like to thank again this year's recipients who, um, who are wholeheartedly for their commitment, for their service and their dedication to our communities. Australia is indeed a better place because of your contribution to our nation. And while I have your indulgence, uh, Mr President, I would also like to acknowledge the three young people in my office this week, Tyler Southwick, Damon Kane and Charlie Hume, who researched the, uh, re the re did the research for this contribution. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, despite, now, despite the Morrison government's best efforts, the Fair Work Commission in that last week announced a 2.5 per cent increase to the minimum wage. It may well have been higher if the figure if the Prime Minister had lifted a finger to advocate for wage rises. Now, you would think, given Mr Morrison has overseen the lowest wage growth in Australian history, that he would be more interested in raising wages. But on wages growth, Mr Morrison has been doing what he does best, and that is pretending he is not responsible. But we know the government has direct influence over wages in this country, and we saw a prime example this last week. When the Morrison government announced a new agriculture visa for workers from Southeast Asia. According to Minister Littleproud, the new visa category will be less regulated than the Pacific Seasonal Workers Program. There are a lot of ways to describe conditions for migrant workers in agriculture, but being too heavily regulated is certainly not one of them. In fact, last week, Unions New South Wales released a report with the Migrant Workers Centre titled Working for $9 a Day. Of the 1,300 horticulture workers surveyed, 89 per cent were on a temporary visa, 78 per cent were underpaid. Some were earning less than $1 an hour on peace rates while working up to 20 hours per day. And we have a word for that sort of work, and it's called slavery. 
Now, I met one of these workers last week, a Taiwanese, very brave Taiwanese woman named Kate, who was getting paid $4 an hour to pick oranges. She said, I quote, I was dumpster diving for food and had to live on, in one room with seven other people. At one farm, she said she was sexually harassed and told she would have to put up with it if she wanted to keep her job. Well, Minister Littleproud can go to the media and complain that Australians don't want to do these jobs. But when these are the conditions, it is hardly surprising that willing labour is hard to come by. And the British government knows the work standards on our farms are appalling. That's why just last week they negotiated for their citizens to be exempt from having to do their 88 days on the farm. Now that's great news for British backpackers. But in their place, we've got a new, unregulated, exploited visa for workers from Southeast Asia that is going to encourage rampant exploitation across the horticulture sector, especially in labour hire. And it isn't just that these poor Southeast Asian migrants like Kate who are going to suffer through this dangerous scheme. Workers from country like, countries like Tonga and Vanuatu are Pacific neighbours who have had opportunities to become to Australia under the more regulated Pacific Seasonal Workers Program are going to be left behind. Because why would a dodgy horticulture labour hire company choose to hire Pacific workers through a more regulated program? And guess what? The same goes for Australians in regional communities, the very people that the National Party are supposed to be representing in this place. Because when the National Party can import migrant labour into regional communities for just $9 a day, why would these companies fork out the minimum wage to give an Australian worker a fair paying job? And too often those jobs in those farms is a result of what happens in supply chains from some of the, most, the biggest and most powerful retailers in this country and the need for proper regulation. Now, the Morrison, Morrison government wonders why it can't shift wages growth up from record lows. Well, I've got a very innovative suggestion for you. Stop exploiting vulnerable migrant workers and driving down wages and conditions for Australian workers. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr uh, President. Uh, I rise tonight to talk about electric vehicles. I just want to uh, say to you, Mr President, I know from time to time it's rare, but you call me and I always answer. Uh, but tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, don't bother, because I'll be in a Tesla car doing a bit of a spin around uh, Canberra. And I'll be doing that because I recognise that electric cars are, in fact, the future. Uh, they are the future. What we have to work uh, uh, out, however, is how Australia slots into that future, because the world is shifting away from internal combustion engines. Norway has set a deadline of 2025 to cease sales of new fossil fuel powered cars. Denmark, the Netherlands, Ireland, Israel and the UK have set 2030 as their target. Quebec in Canada plans to ban gasoline powered cars from 2035, with California doing the same but adding trucks to the ban list. Australia could end up being the dumping ground of outdated internal combustion engine technology that other nations no longer accept. The EU is, has imposed a, a fine system for vehicle manufacturers selling vehicles that exceed uh, the CO2 emission targets. This is a contributing factor to the situation where manufacturers won't ship their newest EVs to Australia because they need them to offset emissions in Europe. So it's the future, and we need to be making an investment in that future. Now, we, we so often hear the claim of range anxiety being a major detractor from electric vehicle take-up, and it's a genuine, con genuine concern for, for many. I, I understand. The, the, the situation. However, just because you've got an range anxiety is not the basis to do nothing about it. It should be a basis for recognising that a solution is required. We need to get infrastructure in place. We need to install more charges. Um, it neatly fits in with the Stop, Revive, Survive campaigns to address fatigue 
to reduce uh, road fatalities. We heard uh, uh, Senator um, Rice talking today about you know, the need to stop off and, uh, and, and um, you know, go to the toilet, have something to eat, all those sorts of things. They're not even just the stop, revive, survive. Just part of our normal functions, being able to stop by the side of the road, spend 20 minutes to fill up your car. We need to invest in R&D with the aim of developing uh, batteries with higher energy density. Now, last month, a Nissan Nexo EV powered by a hydrogen fuel cell travelled from Melbourne to Broken Hill and then beyond on one tank of hydrogen, a distance of 887.5 kilometres, setting a new range record for a fuel, fuel cell-powered vehicle. A little under two weeks ago, a Toyota uh, Miria uh, EV utilising a hydrogen fuel cell travelled 1,003 kilometres across France on a single tank usurping the previous distant record. So technology is the answer, but it won't miraculously occur. It requires a plan and, and an investment. Now that investment doesn't have to come from government, but the government is the only one that can lay out a national plan in which that investment would sit. Deferrals may be justified and they should only be on the basis of a new technology being available uh, in the near term. We need a charging network. We've had a, a national EV charging network infrastructure uh, plan since February 2019, still waiting to identify a proponent, let alone implementing it. We have less than 2,500 uh, charging stations. Norway, in contrast, has around 10,000 public charging stations. So we've got 25 million people and 2,500 public charging stations. Norway's got 5 million people and 10,000 pu uh, public charging stations. The UK added 7,000 new charge charging locations last year alone and now has over 15,000 charging locations with over uh, 24,000 charging points. Now all of this could happen if we had a national strategy. But despite being promised two years ago, the national strategy for electric vehicle is still not available. It seems that lack of a plan is a consistent theme for this government. A tagline is not a plan. Net zero emissions by 2050 sounds good, but how? The uptake of EVs has to form part of the plan. Cars account for about half of Australia's transmission transport emissions, um, which makes them about around 8 per cent of Australia's total. In the absence of national guidance, the states are going ahead and laying out their own electric vehicle strategies and, in some cases, plans to, ta to, to tax electric vehicles. We're having a rail gauge fiasco here. I invite all you senators to come to Peterborough in South Australia because you'll find there we have three different gauges of rail, narrow gauge, standard uh, uh, gauge and broad gauge rail. That's what, uh, that's what we had in Australia because we didn't have a plan, a national plan. And we're doing the same thing for electric vehicles. So we, we, if we look at um, uh, what's going to happen across, uh, uh, across um, uh, Australia, we're going to end up with uh, different charging stations, different charging arrangements, different taxes right across uh, the states. We, we want to have a situation where we have uh, vehicle to grid charges. Okay? And we want to understand when, when we've got a car that can plug into your, to, to your home and has the technology be to be able to, uh, to draw from uh, the network when the network has uh, got lots of capacities and perhaps contribute back to the network when it doesn't. We want to make sure that a car in South Australia can plug in in Victoria and uh, do vehicle to grid. That's sensible stuff, but it requires that a plan be laid out. We need to think about heavy vehicles. Thus far we've mostly focused on passenger vehicles. We need to consider uh, the heavy vehicles. 
buses, trucks and road trains. Now, I've been out to Bus Tech at Edinburgh in South Australia and seen their buses under construction, including electric buses, and have also seen the challenges they're facing to deal with uh, the environment of not having a plan. Should we, should we be electrifying uh, rail lines or investing in commuter trains pow powered by hydrogen fuel cells and the associated hydrogen refuelling stations? What about overland rail? What about farm implementation, the mining equipment and overland rail? This all requires prior planning to bring these vehicles into service. And again, road user charges based on a, uh, user pay models, that's an easily understood concept and the principle makes sense. But it's also clear that the current fuel excise model will have to change. Now, the schemes being developed are quite flawed. We have a system in place for fuel excise um, uh, where you have a difference between the heavy vehicles and, uh, and the light vehicles. Now, we don't have that in place for electric vehicles. Okay? It doesn't deal with such variations. It doesn't, uh, doesn't help. Okay? We have got to develop a national strategy for electric vehicles. A strategy that will ensure we maximise the economic, environmental and social benefits that electric vehicles can bring. We need to think about uh, leading developments in these areas where we can take advantage of a country, how we can back local EV manufacturing like uh, we have in South Australia with ACE vehicles. I do thank the government for, for uh, responding to my advocacy in that regard. How about we create a local capacity in, banner, in, in battery manufacturing? Electric cars are the future. We have a truckload, uh, we have train loads of lithium in Western Australia that could be utilised for that uh, for you know, for that purpose. We need to be investing in R and D, establishing apprenticeships and traineeships uh, in the EV sect sector. We can't sit back and just wait and see what happens. We need to have a plan, and unfortunately, we don't have a plan. And, we, and, and that's a, the, the fault of the government, who promised one and simply has sat quiet and not done anything. Thank you. Senator Macdonald. This morning, I was fortunate to attend the local government of Queensland breakfast. It's the opening salvo for the Australian Local Government Assembly. And I rise to congratulate the many local councils, particularly the smaller councils of my home state of Queensland, for the extraordinary amount of work they do to provide critical grassroots services under financial pressure that increases every year. However, before I do, I want to acknowledge a gentleman that has given a significant part of his life to the Local Government Association of Queensland, Mr Greg Hallam has been the CEO of LGAQ since 1992, that's 29 years, and he has become synonymous with advocating for this critical level of government. Now, Greg is no stranger to hard work, being a dairy farmer in an earlier life. He breeds racehorses. He has given generously of his time volunteering as a parish finance committee chair an elite-level accredited uh, athletic coach for 23 years, as well as with the sporting wheelies for 20 years. His contribution to Australia in these fields has been recognised by being awarded the member AM of the General Division of the Order of Australia in 2018 for his contribution to local government, sport and disaster management, the Public Service Medal in 2000 and the Centenary Medal in 2001. Greg has also received the Olympic Council's Merit Award in 2005, which was personally presented to him by the IOC president, as well as Rhodes Australia's uh, John Shaw Medal, the only local government employee to receive that honour in its 40-year history. And in 2012, Greg was the proud recipient of the National Emergency Medal for his work in Queensland's 2011 natural disaster. In a few short months, Greg will retire and his shoes will be filled by Alison Smith. And all I can say is Greg's enthusiasm for local government and all the wonderful people 
who, re who represent their local communities will miss him. I salute you, Greg Hallam. Now, many local councils, regional councils, face the constant battle of maintaining service provisions across vast areas with small populations while trying to keep rates rises to a minimum. There are grants outside of the long-established FAG schemes that councils access for specialty works on roads, bridges and community infrastructure. And one example of this is the Building Better Regions program that has delivered infrastructure into local government regions across the state. These extra funds go a long way towards helping councils keep rate rises to an absolute minimum, but costs are rising all the time. Infrastructure built regionally is material more in regional centres, more than double the cost of the south in northern Australia. And on top of the regional roles councils play of roads, rates and rubbish, they also look after water supply and treatment, planning and even disaster management. And at the same time, the Queensland Labor government, to its great shame, continually tries to heap more responsibilities on local, on local councils, such as managing cemeteries, state lands, stock routes and major roads. This appalling situation is set against the backdrop of an underspend of close to $6 billion by that government on regional roads. To local councils' credit, they are continuing to find ways to manage, to adapt to these changing circumstances in order to make their regions more livable for the communities that live there. I have visited council-run childcare and aged care centres, and they do an outstanding job providing the services that are normally provided by bigger organisations in the cities. And according to the Local Government Association of Queensland, the Sunshine State is the most decentralised in Australia and its councils are responsible for providing more services than councils in other states and territories. There are 77 Queensland councils, 17 of them First Nations councils, 32 are reef catchment councils and 45 rural and remote councils. There are 41,829 council employees, which cover 294 occupations. The LGAQ reports its councils manage $150 billion worth of community assets, 153,000 kilometres of local roads. They manage $10 billion of spend on providing services for communities on 53,000 hectares of parks and playgrounds or more than 74,000 soccer fields and they have 2,800 bridges under their care. They do more. They spend $25 billion in water and wastewater assets. They have 314 water treatment plants, 76,000 kilometres of water and sewer mains. They have greater planning uh, autonomy and authority, and they are the front line for disaster planning, responsibility and recovery. Councils are also taking it upon themselves the role of tourism promotion. One example from North Queensland is the Hinchinbrook Way campaign that has been credited with boosting the population of Ingham, just north of Townsville, after some years of decline. In Bullia, Mayor Rick Britton is immensely proud of the council-run Min Min Encounter exhibit which treats visitors to a mechanised sound and light show based around the mysterious Min Min lights that abound in the area. And of course, we can't forget the famous camel races of Bullia. Winton and Longreach both boast world-class tourism assets. Uh, further along the Dinosaur Trail, Richmond has a terrific centre. And spare a thought for Kurumba, a population of 531 permanent residences that explodes to 4,500 people over winter. And the council has to provide the services like water and sewerage for that expanded population. Now, unlike those opposite, we don't need a photo opportunity in order to get out to the bush. We believe in our small councils, big and small. And a tangible way that we have demonstrated that is the establishment of the $10 billion reinsurance pool in North Australia. Now, whether it be on a country market, 
host a major street parade or even just insuring assets, the cost of premiums is a crippling burden that is passed on to ratepayers and diverts funds from the essential services that councils provide. And everywhere I travel in regional Queensland, this is one of the main complaints from councils and businesses that, that insurance costs uh, have become crippling. Some estimates have put the estimated drop in premiums from the introduction of the reinsurance pool as as much as a 50 per cent drop in premiums. This would be an extraordinary outcome. But imagine if the Queensland Labor government also halved or even abolished the stamp duty it charges on premiums. The ACCC reports that the state government raked in $65 million in 2018-19 from North Queensland alone in stamp duty, which adds between 9 and 10 per cent to premiums. And from this, the state government allocates only $11 million a year in grants to help people make their homes more cyclone resilient, in effect treating North Queensland like a $54 million cash cow. Well, the stamp duty increases with insurance premium rises and delivers no increase in services. Sadly, especially for people living in North Queensland, their elected Labor representatives have maintained a head-in-the-sand approach to stamp duty issues, and they're quite happy for bus businesses and residents to continue to pay up. The worst aspect of high running costs for businesses and councils is that the costs are passed on to average consumers. Therefore, they're not only paying their own exorbitant, artificially inflated labour sanctioned premiums, they're paying more in rates and for goods and services to cover councils and businesses' high insurance as well. The Queensland Labor government's treatment of its councils is nothing short of contemptuous. But I'm glad I'm part of a coalition federal government that unashamedly backs our councils. I was once told that council bashing is a national sport, and I suspect that's right. However, being a local councillor, while a tough job, uh, is an important one, and I congratulate every councillor across Queensland and Australia. I'm very proud to call these councillors and mayors my friends, and I commend my coalition colleagues for taking very seriously their roles as the council's voice in Canberra. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.